Hi, this is Dror Moshe Kasuto. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like this video. There is a certain very important thing that I wanted to discuss today. I met few people in the last few months that are dealing with very deep issues, very hard and complex um, emotional situations in their lives and finding it very very hard to to deal with their own emotions and with their own feelings and i see that like that it's written people are finding themselves praying and not being answered working hard and not seeing results to their effort the question is why what is uh, what is wrong or what are we missing in our work in our effort that we should uh, improve in how can we aim our hearts in a better way that we'll see re results good results to our effort I remember I read once in the book that names Likut Alachot that been written by the righteous man Rabbi Natan that he said over there that many of us are falling to that mistake thinking that when we experience darkness it's because of sins that we sinned that it's because of mistakes failures that we failed in but the truth is Rabbi Nathan is writing in Likut Alachot is that when people are experiencing darkness it's because that the Creator turned off the light if the Creator would want to turn on the light even the darkest hour will shine like the brightest day now for that you need faith because it's very very easy for a person to fall into sadness and into depression to self-blaming to self-hatred and not to recognize the hand of the Creator in what that you're going through in what that we're going through it's very easy to praise Hashem and to recognize His godliness when we experience miracles and wonders and happy things in life it's very easy it's a natural reaction to a wonderful thing to thank and to praise but when something hard is happening in our life happens in our life so the natural thing that we do is to blame ourselves on that thing instead of recognizing the godly supervision of the Creator on our life making those hours darker than different hours making those moments more complex and more heavy than different moments and periods of time in our lives now the righteous people like Moses and like Elijah the prophet and many others they had like Yirmiyahu the prophet and more they had the ability not to be scared from their own fears not to be rejected by their own fears just to confront their fears and they went and fought their fears all the way and for the will of Hashem because that they knew Hashem so well because they recognized the real will and holy divine <laughs> desire of the Creator from His creation because of that so they could find themselves fighting and arguing 
even with the Creator Himself for His own will, for His success. There is a story on a king that he had a very wild kid and that kid was always, always, always making big, big problems, big issues. Can you call him in? He's welcome to join us. Welcome. Please join us. So there was that prince that was a very problematic, made a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of troubles to his father. And his father, he didn't know how to deal with him. And every time his father was upset, was angry, was fighting, punished him, sent him to his room, whatever, rejected him, told him, you won't be able to see me, you won't be able to come in and talk to me again. And of course, after a while, after a short time, the king's mercy woke up back again and again. He let his son come in, the son came, apologized to his father, told him, listen, father, I'm sorry, whatever. And the king forgave him, the father forgave his son. But one day the kid messed up big time and did something very, 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 very wrong. And the king sent him away and told him, don't come ever to see my face anymore. And when the kid, when the prince left the room, so the king called his guard, the guard for his room, and told him, if my son is coming, don't let me know about it. I don't want to hear about him anymore. I don't want to see him ever again. Don't tell me anything about my son anymore. And don't let him in, of course. So the guard had to keep the king's word. And after a couple of days, when the son came back to ask for forgiveness from his father, the guard told him, listen, I want to help you with all my heart, but I'm not able to do anything. I cannot let you in. And the kid went away crying, you know, and the next day came again and apologized to his father, to apologize to his father, and the guard is still obligated to the king and telling him, I'm sorry, I cannot let you in. And one day um, brings the next and the guard is seeing that the prince feels very bad with himself and doesn't have no advice. And in the same time, the king himself sits in his own room and misses his child and wants to see him, but cannot go back from his last word because he's a king and whatever the king commands, everyone must keep, especially the king himself. So that guard found himself stuck between those lions, between those two holy father and son, and was blaming himself. He said, look, from the side of the father, for sure that the father wants to forgive his son. And from the side of the son, I can see him, that he's trying, that he's coming every day. He wants to knock on the door of his father. He wants to get in. And I'm the only one that is standing between them and creates that separation. So there is no one else that is in charge on making peace between those two except of me. So he went into the king's room and started talking to his heart and told him, you know, even though that you asked me, I must tell you, I feel it's my obligation to let you know that your son, every day he's coming and I'm not letting him in. And I rebuked him and I told him and this and that and he's really doing tshuva, he's really regrets and he wants to fix. And after talking to that king, he went out and when the kid came back, so he looked at him and told him, listen, you really hurt your father and you really need to fix yourself, you really need to work on yourself. And he really did everything that he could 
to make peace between the Father and the Son. And with time, with the days, in one of the days, he found a way to let the prince back in the room, into the room, and to, and to let them reunite. And the love of the father to his child, and the love of the child to his father, is hard to describe in words. And we should know it, that from the side of the Creator to us, the Creator, He loves us, an unconditional love. But the Creator, in one of the days, He made that oath. Asher nishbati ba'api im yevaun el menuchati. He said, I made that oath in time of anger. The Creator said, Asher nishbati ba'api. He made that oath in time of anger. Im yevaun el menuchati. If they will come, to to rest if they will rest to my place to be protected by me so from the side of the king we can see that he made an oath but there is a problem with that oath that oath is a not is not a sealed and and closed oath decree there are many openings in that oath that the Creator took. Hashem said, first of all, Asher nishbati be'api, that He made that oath out of anger. And we know that if a person made an oath while he was upset, while he was angry, that oath doesn't have complete strength doesn't valid you say validated it's not validated because the king was upset and the king himself is letting us know of that he is reminding us that he made that oath out of anger his mind was not completely saddled when he took that oath and his oath was im yevaun el menuchati if they will come to my place to be protected and to be able to rest over there if but if you can interpret that word in two directions if means i'm not gonna let them come back no matter what and the second interpretation is that it's an optional, there is a way to let them back in. If if they will come to my place of rest. If means I might bring them back. So we can see from that that even when the king made that oath and swear that they, so to speak, won't come back, really his intention was still to give them to give us the opportunity, the option to come back. And from the side of the child, the side of the prince, our side, the children of the Creator Himself, we regret, we're apologizing, we really want to come back to Hashem. We really are trying to do the best that we can. I can see in the face of my children, I can see in the face of my students that are also considered as my children. I can see in your faces that you are willing to change, that you are trying to do the best that you can. I have thousands of students around the world and they are very, very sincere and honest. They're very, very open-minded and sensitive and willing to change but the situation is stuck there are things that we cannot do there are locks that we cannot open because we are the prince in that store we are from the other side of the door and there are guards that are watching the door and we need to wake up the mercy of those guards today will walk into the chambers 
to the room of the Almighty and will talk to his heart and will remind him how much he loves his children. And even though that the king is aware to it, there are triggers that must be pulled. There are points that must be discussed. There are things that we must work on to wake up the mercy of the king, to wake up the king from his sleep. Even though that the king is awake and even though that we cannot understand the loving kindness of the Creator, we have our job to wake up the heart of that guard that is in charge of that gate, to open the gate and to let us back in. In every situation that we're finding ourselves as that guard, that we're finding ourselves looking to the sides and seeing all of our beloved ones, all of our surroundings and watching them struggling and willing to do tshuva and hoping and trying and cannot be answered, what that we should do is to judge them favorably, to understand that from their side they are still locked and blocked outside and they cannot get in without us opening the gate for them. And we should know that the Creator Himself, He loves His children, an unconditional love, but we need to talk to His heart and we need to convince Him to open His eyes, to allow us to open the gate. And the gates of tears are never locked and gates of prayers are never locked and gates of good actions are never locked. And we need to break those gates. We need to open the gates of tshuva and to pray for our beloved ones and to remind Hashem of His mercy and His love. And we must go with all power. And we need to know that there are people that are also in charge on that gate and they forgot their mission. And they are locking the gates and they're defending Hashem's honor, the Creator's respect. And they think that they're doing the right job, keeping the word of Hashem that said that His children need to be punished, need to be exiled, need to be rebuked and whatever. But they are ignoring the inner holy desire, the real basic will of the Creator, of the Father to His children that He is full of forgiveness and compassion and He loves and He wants to forgive. And we not allow to let ourselves be from that side that is locking the gates of tshuva. We're not allowed to disqualify no one. We must open gates of tshuva. And if you see someone that is damaging, that is corrupting, that is doing horrible things, you must rebuke him. And you must fight with him for the real honor of the king. But when you see those souls that are asking for forgiveness, that are willing to change for those people, we must pray. And we must put our lives to save them. We must risk ourselves to protect those gentle and beautiful, gorgeous, delicate, gentle, sensitive, gorgeous souls. It's our obligation. That's the only way that we will keep the real will of Hashem. Only when we will really be ready to sacrifice ourselves for others. Really to love, really to care, really to think about their needs. Only in that moment we will become like those righteous people. That when Moses saw that Hashem was upset, when Moses saw that Hashem was angry and Hashem said to Moses, Heref mimeni v'ashmidem, leave me alone for a moment and I'm destroying them all. Moses looked deep into those words of Hashem. That Hashem told him, leave me alone for a moment and I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses said to himself, I see from your words that if I'm not going to let you go even for a second, you won't kill them. And for sure that that's why you use those words. He read between the lines. And he recognized the divine will, the holy intention of the Creator. 
that hates the fact that he should punish his children. But with children like us you lose your mind. You lose your mind, it's reality. With kids like us you lose your mind, like you're losing your mind with your children, like I'm losing my mind with mine. The Creator is losing his mind with all of us, all of us together. It's a, it's, it's a trap. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's lethal. It's poison. It's dangerous. You cannot keep yourself always like, you see your kids are fighting with no reason, hitting each other for no reason, stealing from each other, kidnapping each other, raping each other, destroying, killing each other, abusing each other. You lose your mind. As a parent you lose your mind. And kingship of heaven is similar to kingship of earth. The Creator made the world to be in such complicated and also simple. It's all reflecting, the world is reflecting the kingship of heaven for us to learn. What that happens here is happening in heaven. What that you see that goes on here, that's exactly what that happens and going on in heaven. You can learn on heaven from earth. The Creator, He is looking down to earth and, and, and influencing His thoughts, His wishes, His desires, His messages to us, to wake us up, to call us. People are being kidnapped, people are being slaughtered, people are being abused, people are being used, people are, 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 are being destroyed. And not only by governments, and not only by the armies, no, by simple people, by me and you, by regular people in the streets that we can rebuke, that we can hurt, that we can insult, that we can ashamed, that we can disrespect, that we can ignore. And while ignoring those people, we are blocking their way from, to heaven, blocking their way to complete their tshuva. And we have that obligation to open the gates of tshuva for every person that is willing to do that. Moses had the ability when he saw that Hashem is threatening to destroy and to kill, to put himself instead and he said to Hashem, if you want to kill them you should erase me from the book that you wrote, you should kill me first. Horgeni na harog. Slaughter me alive, kill me now, he said to Hashem. If you want to kill them, kill me first. Erase me from the book that you wrote. You know what it means to say, erase me from the book that you wrote? What was he trying to say? That he was as guilty as them? He, was as... he said, I, I won't let you do that. That's what he said, first of all. I'm not letting you do that. Kill me first. Me first. You want to kill them? Kill me. I won't see them dying. I'm not going to let you kill them. That's first. And then what he did? He went up to Mount Sinai and for 40 days and 40 nights he didn't eat and didn't drink and didn't close his eyes to sleep. He was willing to sacrifice himself. He went up to Mount Sinai with no backpack, with no food, with no sodas, with no drink, nothing. He went up to fight, to fight Hashem, to fight the Creator of the universe, to argue. And after 40 days of argument, Hashem told him, Salachti kidvarecha, I forgive them like you said. So, like you said, means that the arguments of Moses convinced Hashem to forgive. Why? How can it be? What? You will say Hashem was wrong and Moshe fixed him? No! No way! Hashem is never wrong! So what? How can it be that Hashem changed his mind? Hashem never changed his mind! Also, that's what we learned at least. Because Moses realized what was the real will of Hashem even when Hashem was angry and said, I'm about to destroy them all. And Moses figured it out. Hashem, Moses opened Hashem opened Moses' eyes to see the truth. That even when the parent is saying to his child, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to destroy you, he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't know what to do. 
he is losing his mind, yes. But he is not there to kill his child. He's using those words because the kid is in deep, deep sleep and he's not waking up no matter what you do with him. So you find yourself as a parent trapped. And the king himself is Melech Asur Birhatim. He is a prisoner to, our, to, the, to the edges of our mind. Means that if we are holy, so he is in a holy place. But when we are negative and impure, the Creator is trapped with us. Shochen itam betoch tum otam lives with them in their own impure places, inside their contaminations. When we're following our lusts and our desires, the Creator must pleasure us in those foreign places. If you enjoy foreign things and you feel pleasure in those foreign dark places, you should know that you took Hashem with you to pleasure you in that place. There is no real pleasure in this world. You can do something and enjoy it and someone else will go and do the same and will be disgusted. He will say, what am I doing here? I don't want that. He won't feel no satisfaction. One will eat meat and feel delicious taste from that meat and someone else will want to puke. He won't be able to enjoy chocolate. You'll enjoy chocolate. He cannot touch it. Why? Because the Creator is choosing to pleasure a person by angels that are pleasuring and satisfying the person. And one person can enjoy chocolate for 50 years of his life and in a moment the Creator will take that ability from him and he won't be able to enjoy chocolate anymore. Why? Because Hashem won't. Only the will of Hashem is taking place in this world and nothing else exists except of the will of Hashem. And when Hashem wants you to be happy, you'll be happy, poor, with no money, with no food, with no family, all alone and dancing in the streets if Hashem wants. And Hashem can make the richest person that lives in a castle with hundreds of children and grandchildren to be the saddest and most depressed person in the world. Hashem is able to rise the ones that were low and to humiliate and to bring down the ones that were in the highest places of them all because He controls the creation. And nothing moves against His will. Only what that He commands is taking place and happening in this world and nothing moves without His will. Nothing at all. And like we said before, we think, and it's easy for us to think, that the wonders and the miracles and the salvations are the things that are happening by the supervision of Hashem, by the will of Hashem. But on all the negative things that are happening in our lives, it's so easy for us to blame ourselves. But the fact that there is darkness in certain hours of our life is only because the Creator turned off the light. The Creator said to Moses, in that day I'm going to hide my face from them. And the Creator Himself, He was the one that made that decree to minimize and to cover the light of the moon. And He was the one that created night and He created darkness. He made the day and He made the night. He made the wonderful hours and He made the exile. He decreed on the exile. He made those decrees. He made those decisions. And we are now trapped in that circle of life that sometimes you're down in the darkness and the sun is not illuminating to your side when you're in that dark side of the globe. And in a few hours suddenly you find yourself back in the sun again, enjoying the light and satisfying life and joyful life. And then you're down again. And you're losing your mind and you don't know how to handle common things and certain simple situations that everyone think to themselves that they're supposed to know how to handle and you can't handle anything. You can't handle the handle of your door. You can't get into your own house. You don't know what to do. You're locked outside of your own house and you don't have an answer. You don't have the key. Sometimes you can look for your glasses and they're on your forehead for hours and you can't find them nowhere. Your car keys are in your pocket and you, you felt your pocket and it's there and you can't feel them. Because Hashem numbed your, your, your palm. Hashem took the ability to sense from you because He wanted you to be blind. 
because the Creator wanted the person to be blind for a moment, for an hour, for a month, for a year, and then He reopens His eyes, if needed, if that's His will. But the Creator has got an inner, deeper thought than what had been expressed. On the lines, when you read the verses, there are verses. Okay, those verses are threatening us, are warning us, are opening our eyes. Those verses are rebuking us. Those words are guiding us, are telling us what we should do. But in the same time, there is a deeper meaning, a deeper intention of the Creator that only the real righteous ones got access to. They have the ability to sense the divine will of the Creator. And that's why in the time of Elijah the prophet, when it was not allowed to sacrifice sacrifices out of the area of Jerusalem and Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple, Elijah the prophet is taking his backpack and his helper and going up to Mount Carmel in Haifa. It's something like two weeks walk away from Jerusalem. Two and a half hours drive, three hours drive. And he's walking for two weeks and finding Am Israel over there and calling them all to join him to Mount Carmel. And he's building an altar on Mount Carmel and sacrificing sacrifices on Mount Carmel in front the world, in front all Am Israel, in front all people, in front of the sky, in front of heaven, in front of Hashem. Violating a rule that's been written in the Torah for the sake of Hashem. And it's written in the last chapter of the first Mishnah, Masechet Brachot, in the Mishnayot. The last line is saying, Amar Rabbi Natan, Rabbi Natan said, Et la'asot l'ashem heferu toratecha. There are times that for Hashem, for the sake of Hashem, for the will of Hashem, you need to violate some rules of the Torah. There are moments in life that for Hashem you need to go off the main highway of Hashem's way. Like that it's written. That if Hashem, if a person sees that he needs to violate one Shabbos for the sake of keeping many, many others, so you should violate one with that intention. But only when your mind is to keep many others. So you see that for the sake of the future, to have the ability to keep many, many wonderful weekends, Shabbatot, for that you need sometimes to violate Shabbat. And who's going to guide you on that? Who will be that crazy person to guide you on that, to do that? The fact that I volunteered for that crazy job, it's my problem. But <laughs> between you and me, in reality, in those hours, you should take decisions on your own. Sometimes you need to be that person to decide on your life. If now, when you're checking yourself and you see that you're willing to do Hashem's will, the Creator's will, but you cannot go mainstream, you cannot go by the book, but still your inner desire is to do for Hashem's sake, so you should count on yourself and go with it all the way, with no fear. You should count on the fact that you recognize inside of yourself that your will is honest and that your intention is pure. And based on that, you are allowed to say that suck for yourself, to take that decision on your own, to change your way and to go in a different route. Because you know that your intention is pure. Because you checked yourself and you recognize that your intentions are pure and you're aiming for the sake of Hashem, for the will of Hashem, for the sake of His people. And you're violating some rules. You're breaking some, some rules for Hashem. Like Moses. Hashem is saying to Moses, I'm quoting those verses all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. That's my mission. That's my mission. 
Hashem is saying to Moses, I'm going to send my angels with you to protect you and to lead you to the promised land. Moses is answering Hashem, if you're not coming with us, we're not going anywhere. What's that? How, like, which response is that? What do you mean? Like Hashem is telling you, I'm sending my angels with you to protect you. Isn't it fantastic? Isn't it wonderful? You will make it. But Moshe is realizing that when the father is sending his child with someone else, it's not perfect. Something is wrong here. And Moshe, he can smell. Moshe, he has a nose. Moshe can sense. Why Moshe can sense? Why? He was sensitive. Was he such a genius? Moses came and received the ability to go down in a different lifetime, in a different generation, and to be in a speech of Rabbi Akiva. To see Rabbi Akiva 1500 years later from his generation, and to see Rabbi Akiva teaching his students in the days of the temple. Hundreds or more than thousand years after Moses passed away in the desert. And when he saw the speech of Rabbi Akiva, he lost his mind. He was confused. He could not understand Rabbi Akiva's speech. And he went to Hashem and he told him, Listen, I am not the right one to give the Torah to Am Israel. I'm not worthy. I'm not able. Choose him. Take Rabbi Akiva. He's much wiser than me. Look at him. Those were the words of Moses to Hashem. Looked at himself and said, Me? Compared to this? To Rabbi Akiva? No competition. Can't compare me to him. I can't fit in his shoes. But Hashem told him, No, no, no. You have your job and he has his. He got his job. Go do your job. You're my man to deliver the Torah. He will do his job in his generation. Don't worry. I have a mission for him. But you, I want you to give the Torah. You're humble. You're honest. You're simple. I want you. Hashem said to Moses, You think that Moses was the man of God? Moses was the man of truth. Moses was an honest person. Moses was a person that was able to tell his wife, Listen, honey, we're moving back to Egypt. What? He was able to pack his two children and his wife and not to circumcise his children after the eighth day that he knows that he must do that. Because since the generation of Abram, they were circumcising the children in the eighth day. Yitzchak been circumcised on the eighth day. Since that day, in every eighth day to the birth, they were circumcising their children. But Moses, after his children born, and he realized that he's about to take them to a hard journey to Egypt, and he realized that he's risking their lives if he will circumcise them. So he decided to take them with him without Brit Mila, without, without circumcising them and his wife and to go back to Egypt. To go back to Egypt, it's like to go back to Germany or Poland 75 years ago. Okay, honey, we're in Israel. Listen, take your kids and we're going. What? What? We've been saved. Like Pharaoh didn't attack us yet. We're allowed to be free. Hitler didn't kill us yet. We're allowed to live in the desert. Some heathen supervision is protecting us because the kingship of Pharaoh was taking nations and, and, and bringing them into Egypt and slavery them and take them under, under uh, in prison and destroying one nation after the, after the other. That was the nature of Egypt. That was their job. That's what, what they were doing. And he had 
like some kind of mercy on Jethro, the father of Tzipporah, the wife of Moses, and all of his community and his people were protected because he was working as a high priest for the kingship of Pharaoh, for Pharaoh's interest. He was one of his advisors, and they had their so-called quiet. No one touched them. And Moses been saved from Egypt, and they didn't kill him over there. And now he's telling his beloved ones, okay, we're going back. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Crazy. Crazy. And he can take that decision not to circumcise his children because that he's realizing that he is risking their, their, his children by taking them to that hard journey, being wounded from, from that cutting, from the circumcised, from the Brit Milah. So he's not doing it. Moses didn't circumcise his children in the eighth day? Yes. Why? Because he knows that Hashem wants him to live and Hashem wants his children to live. And he knows exactly what Hashem wants from him. And when Hashem tells him, I want you to go with the angels, he can feel something is wrong here. Something is fishy. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. No way. You wouldn't tell me that you're sending me with your angels, with your people, if something was wrong and you decided to stay out. So if you're not coming with us, we're not going anywhere. We're staying with you in the desert. Even to die, we don't care. This is Moses. And this is why Moses was the chosen one. Not because he was a genius, not because he was talented. His speech was defected. He had problems with expressing himself in public. He was not able to talk right. It's written. Moshe was kvad, his mouth was heavy. Kvad peu, kvad lashon. His tongue was heavy and his mouth was heavy. What does it mean? I don't know. But something was wrong over there with his mouth. Or that he was shy. Or that he was not so much of a speaker. I don't know. Something. He, maybe he was mumbling. He, I don't know. Something was wrong. He was not perfect. But he was the chosen one. Why? He had that size of a heart. Like that. And he was not scared to fight even with Hashem for the sake of Hashem. For Hashem's real purpose. For Hashem's real intention. And on Hashem it's written, Nitzchuni banai, Nitzchuni banai. Praise the one that when his children are winning him, he's happy. He's enjoying to see us when we're winning. When we're overpowering Him. Moses went up to Mount Sinai and Hashem told him, Moses, Alit al -amarom, it's written, you went up on Moses, it said, Alit al -amarom, you went to the highest place of them all. Marom, it's the highest level in the sky, in heaven. Shavita Shevi. And you took the Torah in, in captive, like you stolen the Torah from Hashem. And the Midrashim are explaining that there was a fight between the Creator and Moses on the Torah. Moses went up to a place that on that place it's written that Hashem is alone in that place. Hashem Marom Levado. Hashem is alone in the place that calls Marom. Suddenly Moses is coming to that place that no one ever been in that place before except of Hashem alone. And Hashem was alone in that place with His Torah, learning and enjoying the Torah, His own wisdom. And suddenly Moshe is getting into that space. Out of nowhere, he finds himself in there. He climbed so high that he went to that place that no one ever been there before. He had a long rope. He knew how to climb mountains. No, he was crazy. He went up all the way. You think that you cannot go for 40 days and 40 nights without eating and drinking? Moses didn't care about those assumptions. He had a problem and he went to solve it. And that's it. And 40 days passed. 
And then the Midrashim are saying, and in the Gemara it's written, that Moses seeing Hashem holding the Torah, so he held it in one side, he's overpowering Hashem, fighting with Hashem. Suddenly he's grabbing Hashem's Torah. Hashem is standing, we cannot describe that, we cannot understand it, but Hashem is alone in his place with the Torah. Suddenly Moshe is getting into that space, holding the holy tablets and start pulling them from Hashem. And it's written, Gavar kocho shel Moshe, and Moshe's power was bigger, stronger than Hashem's. What? Hashem, He owns the powers. He gives the power to those poor ones, to the weak ones. Anotel le'yaev koach. He gave Moses more power than the power that he left for himself. Tzadik Moshe lir'at Elokim. The righteous man receives the power to lead Hashem's fear from heaven, to be the faith of Hashem. Hashem is following the righteous man. Hashem is asking, Mi Moshe be? Who is the one that controls me? And the verse is answering, Tzadik Moshe lir'at Elokim. The righteous man controls the faith of Hashem. Why? Because Retzon Yere'av Yaseh. Because Hashem is following the will of the ones that dedicated their lives to Him. Like me. And Hashem will do whatever I'll tell Him to do. Why? Because I gave Hashem everything He asked me. And I'm not scared to say that. Because I know that I'm honest. And I'm not scared. I'm happy. I'm sad and I'm happy. I'm broken and I'm healthy. I'm poor and I'm rich. I'm wounded and I'm healing others. By the power of Hashem. Only by the power of Hashem. If you would ask me how are you surviving, there is no answer to that. Except of because Hashem wants me to hold on. Because Hashem gives me life and Hashem gives me power and gives me strength to survive and to hold on in wars and in difficulties and in challenges that cannot be written and cannot be described. And I'm only thankful for the fact that today we're enjoying the social media and thousands on thousands of my life stories are being recorded. And one day they will be all printed in books. And we don't actually even need books because they're at least spread outside and you can hear them. Only because Hashem wants. Only. Only because Hashem wants to reveal His wisdom to you that you will know that He loves you and unconditional love. That His love to you is written between the lines and not in the verses themselves. You need to see through the verses. If you want the spirit of Hashem, the spirit of Mashiach is hovering above the water. Ruach Elokim merachefet al amayim. It's not in the water. It's above the water. It's hovering. You don't even need to understand what that's written in the verses when you want to come closer to Hashem. You just need to have the right intention and to open the book. And Hashem will erase His decree and Hashem will forgive His people. Because Hashem said, There will be that righteous man that will come and will atone that oath, that will erase that oath, that will break it. Because He will show me, He will show Hashem that Hashem's decree, that Hashem's oath was not complete, was not sealed in blood. Lo bedam, not in blood. Hashem sits in His hidden place and He's crying and His eyes are tearing to the ocean, to the large sea. And He's saying, Oy li she nishbati ve'en mi shem eferli. 
I feel regret on the fact that I made that oath and I can't find that one that will atone, that will erase that, that will cancel that oath that he swore, that he made. But he reveals his regret and he's saying, Malo banav. The king that exiled his children doesn't have anything left. He's sad and broken. And in the hidden places he's sitting and crying. And crying. Hashem is crying. And you can hear his roar. You can hear his scream. You can hear his sorrow. It's out there in the world. You can see the pain. It's the pain of the Creator. The creation is bleeding. All of our eyes are tearing. All of our hearts are wounded and scarred. We've been burned so many times. And Hashem is with us in our sorrow, in our exile. The ones that are in charge on the gates of Tshuva are not allowed to reject no one. We have that opportunity that obligation and opportunity in the same time to bring in as many souls as possible to wake them up to recognize their inner endless love to Hashem and to remind Hashem of His love to His children and we need to shake both sides like crazy like Moses, like Elijah, like Yirmiyahu that Yirmiyahu is able to stand and to curse his mother to bring him down to this world, to curse the moment that he born to this world. Hates his life, hates the sorrow and pain that he sees around him, cannot stand the tears and the bloodshed, cannot, and cursing himself and asking Hashem, why, why in the world you chose me for that? Shooting your arrows to my kidneys, destroying me. Eagles, my enemies, are, 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 are predators coming to attack me, killing me. But his mission is his mission. And he's going and keeping the word of Hashem, petting the children of Hashem, the wounded one, the innocent ones. That's our obligation and that's our mission. And we should never, ever go back no matter what we will see with our eyes. No matter what we will see with our eyes, we're not allowed to go back. Not to go back to other people's opinions, to other people's methods. We should believe in our own faith, in what you believe, that there is someone that cares about you. Don't go back. Do you believe that there is someone that can heal you even if you're the most sickest person in the world? If you have an answer, yes, don't give up on it. Don't give up. If you believe that there is a redemption that is about to take place one day, make it today. Force this day to be the day of redemption. And if it won't happen today, so force tomorrow to be that day of redemption. Do everything you're able to do, to do good and to uncover the good and to reveal the light and to wake up the children that went into deep sleep and are overwhelmed from the darkness and risks of exile. Cannot drive the roads, cannot walk in the streets, cannot swim in the sea, cannot walk in the park cannot breathe the oxygen, the air outside, cannot watch TV, cannot use their phones, cannot move from their sofas, cannot sit for too long because of their backs, cannot move, terrified, petrified. We need to save them against our laziness, against our emotions, against our feelings, against our fears. We must fight and fight with no end never to put down the weapon no matter what we will see in front of our eyes never to stop fighting and saving souls and waking up the mercy of heaven to come back together like a child that will never no child will ever give up on the peace between his parents Never, it, you cannot, 
you cannot ever convince the child that there is a better way if that child still have, has hope. You can never convince him that his parents should be separated. It, it's like to tell him you need to die. No. No way. No, but the, I will be happier over there. Doesn't answer my logic. It's not right. Separation? Wrong. Never. Fixing, finding ways, consulting, therapist, support, help, screaming, breaking the walls, I don't know what, moving to another country, forgetting everything, leaving everything behind, I don't know what, drugs, alcohol, everything you offer. Just please stay together. The father and his son, the mother and her child, separation will never be accepted, will never be an answer, will never f f fit into my logic. Separation from godliness, since the moment I realized there is a creator, my faith in wonders and in miracles became in front of my eyes. Now, yes, it's true. It's hidden today. Cannot find them all over the place. We're not hitting the rock and water are coming out of the, of the rock. No, it's not happening today. We cannot see it because of certain reasons. But to believe in it, we must. To fall into that deep sleep of religion of today, you must wake up in the morning and run to the shul and to pray and to put filin, rashi and rabbeinu tam. And if you're a right arm, so you need to put your filin on your left. And then you need to fulfill your obligation to the other opinions and you need to put it also on your right. And if you're a chassid and you're putting also rabbeinu tam, so you need to put four times filin a day. Yes. No. You need to relax. That's what you need. You need rattling. And you need to drink it with a large cup of cold water and to breathe. That's what you need. You don't need to put four times tefillin a day. You want to put Shimu Sharaba six times tefillin a day. To, to, to answer, to be Yotzei Yedei Chova, all the opinions, right? Eight times a day tefillin. Of course. What? Don't you want to be Yotzei Yedei Chova, all the opinions of other Paskim? No, I don't. No, I don't. I want only one of them to agree with me that what that I'm doing is kosher and it's enough. Yes. I don't want to be called Talmid Chacham. I don't want to be called a righteous man. I just want to survive and to hold on and to make my life as normal and sane as can be and to spread sanity in the world. That's what I want. I want to be able to drink a cup of milk if I'm thirsty, even if it's not Chalav Israel. If it's kosher. And if it's kosher, so I want to drink it even if it's not Chalav Israel. And if you will say that a Talmid Chacham, I'm not a Talmid Chacham. And I'm not claiming to be a Talmid Chacham. And I'm not a rabbi. And I'm not claiming to be a rabbi. And I'm nothing. I own an iPhone. That's what I have. That's who I am. I own a wonderful, gigantic iPhone that I use it for almost everything I do in my life. That's what I'm doing. So I'm not allowed to be chazan in your synagogue, right? Yeah, you're holding a non-kosher phone. Kosher phone. You need to be a kosher person. You don't need to have a kosher phone. You need to be a kosher person. You need to be an honest person. You don't need to have a kosher phone. If you find yourself that you're not kosher, phone or not phone won't help you. You need to work on your kashrut. You need to become kosher. You need to work on your midot. To respect your wife. To watch my videos. To fix your life. To take yourself seriously. That's what you need. To work on your attributes, on your manners, on your sensitivity to others. To care, to love. That's what we need to do. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this video very much. 
please now remember to subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends to help spread faith in the world. For more, please visit amuna.com. May your light shine always and your requests should be answered with the greatest blessings. Amen.